Good evening, my friends. The Solemnity of All Saints Day is one of the most important celebrations in our liturgical year. As its title suggests, this commemoration is not only a celebration of only one saint, but of all the followers of Christ from the beginning of the Church's history till the end of time, who are now with Him in heavenly paradise. But more importantly, it is a celebration not so much of the dead, but of the living. It is our celebration and a kind of reminder of who we are and what we are destined to become, saints. The celebration of all the saints was not formally established until the middle of the 8th century AD. What was celebrated from the beginning of church history was a commemoration of the martyrs, meaning witnesses, those Christians who were persecuted by the Romans but chose to die instead of renouncing their faith. On May 13, 609, Pope Boniface IV consecrated the Pantheon in Rome to the Virgin Mary and all the martyrs. It became the Basilica of St. Mary and the Martyrs. The Pantheon, built in around the second century, was a Roman pagan temple before it was transformed into a Catholic church in the seventh century. Please note that the original date of the Feast of All the Saints was in May, and it was with a purpose. The Church intended to negate the ancient pagan holiday called Lemures, or Lemures, which honors the spirits of the dead. Pope Gregory III in the 8th century moved the celebration to November 1st, and May 13 was suppressed. From then on, up until now, the solemnity of all the saints is celebrated on November 1st. This solemnity is typical of our Catholic religion because there are no other religions in the world that honor its most celebrated dead members in a solemn and respectful way. The nearest religion that comes close to our celebration is, of course, the Orthodox religion, which still honors all their saints somewhere around May 13, around Easter time. Nowadays, they assign the Sunday after Pentecost as the All Saints Sunday, which also closes the, their Paschal season. The Eastern religions, like here in Asia, also honor their ancestors in elaborate and solemn manner, but they don't consider them really as holy persons like we do to our saints. The honor we give to the saints on All Saints Day is not only for the known and famous saints that the Church have canonized. The canonization is the process by which the Church makes official a person to be a saint and normally assigns a day as his own feast or memorial within the year. But on All Saints Day, we especially commemorate the countless unknown saints and holy persons throughout history who are not enrolled and celebrated in the yearly calendar of the Church. Recognizing all these saints is not an invention of the Church or a figment of its imagination. Our belief in the saints is actually based on scriptures, as we will read in today's liturgy. The common theme of our readings today is about assembly or a gathering of people either in heaven or on earth. And it is God 
who calls them together after the redemptive work of Jesus, his Son, and after having received the gift of the Holy Spirit. The first reading is from the book of Revelation and speaks about a multitude of peoples who were first gathered here on earth and then found themselves in heaven. I, John, saw another angel come up from the east, holding the seal of the living God. He cried out in a loud voice to the four angels who were given power to damage the land and the sea. Do not damage the land or the sea or the trees until we put the seal on the foreheads of the servants of our God. I heard the number of those who had been marked with a seal, 144,000 marked from every tribe of the children of Israel. The four angels that would damage the whole of mankind are similar to the vision of Zechariah of the destruction of the people of Israel in the Old Testament. But before this new destruction will take place, God sent an angel to delay it so that the people of Israel could be marked by the seal of God. Now, as everywhere in the book of Revelation, all these are highly symbolic. The delay of the destruction of mankind is the time given to the church to gather together as one people here on earth. The four angels are the destructive forces that will destroy the world at the end of time. The new angel is either a messenger of God or the Holy Spirit who will attach a sign or a seal to the people of God who will be saved, numbering 144,000. This number is not only numeric, it is highly symbolic, based on the numerology of the Bible. The 12 stands for the 12 tribes of Israel, multiplied by another 12, which stands for the 12 apostles. So we have the old and the new people of God, respectively, total of which is multiplied by a thousand, which is a reference to perfection or completion. So the number 144,000 is not a physical count of peoples, but a description that countless peoples from the Old to the New Testament will be gathered and be taken over by God, as symbolized by being marked by the seal. The seal indicates the possession of God. Anyone bearing God's seal means that he or she belongs to God, his children, and enjoys his protection and salvation. After this, I had a vision of a great multitude, which no one could count from every nation, race, people, and tongue. They stood before the throne and before the Lamb, wearing the white robes and holding palm branches in their hands. They cried out in a loud voice, Salvation comes from our God, who is seated on the throne and from the Lamb. Now, the vision transfers to heaven, and St. John witnesses another assembly that cannot be counted from every nation, race, people, and tongue, worshiping the throne, which is a symbol of God the Father, and the Lamb, which is no other than Jesus Christ. They were wearing white robes and holding palm branches, all symbols of victory and chanting salvation. Now, who are all these innumerable peoples? asked John. They are those who emerged from the great trial and now enjoy God's welcome and presence, God's holy ones, the saints. Our second reading taken from the first letter of St. John 
gives another perspective of this assembly of God. Beloved, see what love the Father has bestowed on us, that we may be called the children of God. Yet so we are. The reason the world does not know us is that it did not know Him. Beloved, we are God's children now. What we shall be has not yet been revealed. We do know that when it is revealed, we shall be like Him, for we shall see Him as He is. Everyone who has this hope based on Him makes himself pure as He is pure. This short reading from St. John is compact with so much meaning. We have seen how God assembles people here on earth, the church, and in heaven, the saints, after their triumph over sin. Now in this reading, St. John talks about the children of God, us, the church, who are reborn through our baptism. All of this is because of the love that the Father has bestowed on us. The assembled people are God's children, in fact and in destiny. We are God's children now. What we shall be has not yet been revealed. But John assures us that we shall be like Him, meaning we shall be holy just as God is holy. The condition is we maintain purity, meaning we imitate God's holiness while here on earth. We now come to our gospel passage from the segment of St. Matthew's Gospel known as the Sermon of the Mount. The message of the Beatitudes will complete what we have seen in our two readings. God wanted to form a people by making them His children while here on earth. He has marked them with His seal because of the graces He gives through the sacraments of the Church. While we await our final destiny to be with God in heaven as His saints, we have to live a life of holiness and justice here on earth. The Beatitudes show us the way on how to become holy here on earth. We remember that the Beatitudes begin the first part of the new teachings of Jesus contained in the Sermon of the Mount, which comprise three chapters in St. Matthew. The Beatitudes are wisdom teachings, part of the ancient Jewish tradition, and are meant to inspire behavior or conduct. Remember that wisdom in the scriptures is about life, not about intelligence or the mind. Now, how does the Beatitude do this? The Beatitudes describe a situation or a condition that will inspire or discourage behavior depending on the outcome of such a situation. If the situation results in something good or positive, it will inspire positive behavior, which is the cause of happiness. That's why. This form of teaching is called beatitude, makarios in Greek, which means to be happy or to be blessed. The first beatitude, to be poor in spirit, is a cause of happiness. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Because the poor rely not on human power or wisdom, but on the power of God. Remember, the kingdom of God will be in the hands of the poor and not on the rich. The third beatitude, blessed are the meek, is the same as this first one because the same word in Aramaic is used for both poor and meek. 
Only one word is used for them. And they speak of inheriting or possessing God's kingdom. The second beatitude, blessed are those who mourn. And the fourth, blessed are they who hunger and thirst. Are ordinary earthly conditions that when born with patience and trust will be remedied or set right in the end. St. Matthew added four more Beatitudes than St. Luke, and these additional four Beatitudes deal with aspects of religious piety. Blessed are the merciful. Blessed are the pure of heart. Blessed are the peacemakers. To those who possess these conditions will be compensated with the same, because God is all merciful. God is all pure. God is the source of peace. The last beatitude are for the persecuted ones. Blessed are they who are persecuted for the sake of righteousness. When they insult you and persecute you and utter every kind of evil against you. Why is persecution and suffering causes for rejoicing and being blessed. Because persecution in the name of Jesus is a clear sign of God's kingdom, which is opposite and unacceptable to the world's values. Persecution because of Christ will bring us happiness in the end. I just don't know if our readings today for this great solemnity are evident and forceful enough to make us realize our great calling to be holy in our Christian life. Many Christians and Catholics, because of ignorance or neglect, are simply not sold to the idea of holiness. Some are very skeptical and even cynical about it because they think that holiness is just too difficult, out of this world, unattainable. Others would dismiss sanctity as part of their Christian life because it is only for a select few and not for all. Others just don't care. But let me tell you one thing. If you have been baptized in the Catholic Church, by nature, you have been given the grace of holiness. That spiritual mark that we received in the sacraments of baptism and confirmation are the permanent reminders for us of who we are and whose we are. We are God's children and God our Father is waiting for us in heaven because we belong to Him. Let us always remember this and never forget. We are God's beloved children. There is another thing we have to do. To live this important knowledge that we have. Behaving as beloved children of a loving Father. The way of love is the way to holiness. And Jesus has already pointed out the way of loving through the Beatitudes. Poverty of spirit, which means to live a life of faith and trust. To mourn, which means to accept whatever is unacceptable on earth because of our creaturely condition, sin, suffering, death, pain and sickness and injustice, but without losing hope. To be meek is to be humble and patient, which will conquer the earth. To hunger and thirst for righteousness means to work for justice for all without discouragement. To be merciful, especially to the poor and those neglected, because it is just the right thing to do. To be pure in mind, body, and spirit, 
which is our way of honoring God. To work for peace means to abandon retaliation and hate in the face of violence. And finally, to accept the suffering and persecution that is a result of our being a true follower of Christ. To be a genuine Christian is to embrace suffering and trial. Holiness is our badge, our being identified to Jesus, our Savior. We are all called to be saints. God bless us all.